Welcome to Oromo Affairs. Welcome to Oromo Affairs. As you know, this is Ace Drew, your host. I'm trying to keep it very intellectual at the same time, very funny like David Letterman. This is the conversation for East Africa and the minorities in America. So I have tonight a special guest. His name is Mark Corrin. He's a senator from the state of Minnesota. We're going to talk about frauds, crimes, and election. So... Senator Mark, welcome to the show. Say hello hey. to my East Africans, all in general, and especially the Oromos, as you can hello. see. Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. It's in Oromo is what's possible to bring peace, and that's what we're going to talk about today, government. Great. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks, Ace. For sure, for sure. Mark, you know, you, you, came, you came on my show before. You and I talked on the show before. We talked about yes. Second Amendment, how important Second Amendment is. And yes, we today, did. Crime is in there, so we're going to talk about more security today, too. So as you know, Mark, the biggest news in Minnesota <clears throat> is about this fraud. This fraud. I'm sorry. I messed up the screen a little bit. Feeding our future fraud, Mark. Tell me about this fraud, man. You're in the Minnesota government. You make the rules and regulation. How did this happen? And whose fault is this, man? Let me yeah. know. Whose fault is this? Somebody got to yeah. be accountable for it. Who should we hold accountable, Mark? As the people, who should we vote out of the office this coming November? When you look at it, Ace, you know, you look at this. Is this These dollars were designed to feed from the Department of uh, Agriculture. And uh, it was actually sent through to be managed by the Minnesota Department of Education, to feed children through the pandemic and it's still going on today. Um, it was it was designed and, and who, to, who to blame, right? The basic checks and balances of trying to discover fraud or the basic checks and balances and and making sure qualified entities receive dollars, right? They're, and almost all of them are nonprofits. I prefer to call them nonprofiteers um, mm -hmm. because very few truly nonprofits. And when you look at it, they failed at the fundamental basics. In, in the process of this uh, granting out um, in almost exclusively to a very small group of people, the first $250 million, $250 million. And, and I think the average cost is they normally get reimbursed about $2 a meal. So they're claiming that they've fed 125 million meals to children in Minnesota for that period of time for the first $250 million. Remember, Ace, they also, they're in the middle right now of spending another $250 million. So $500 million has been sent to Minnesota to be managed by the Department of Education and, and distributed to these nonprofits. They failed the basics. They failed the basics. Um, when you look at the organization Feeding Our Future, the, one of the umbrella organizations who then helped bring in all of these other nonprofits in, in um, getting the grants uh, pushed out to them. I don't think they I don't think they did the basic background checks. Did they ensure that these entities um, were actually capable? Do they have a facility? They did none of those things. Nope. I think in indictment number 49, number 49, we're talking about over, yeah. over 40, 40 almost 50 people. Um, yeah. He was a media company working out of a tiny little office. And I think he was claiming to feed 1,500 people uh, twice a day, seven days right. a week, case. And that's what all of them are. And so did they look at those entities and say, well, I wonder how a media company would be able to provide, right? They have no history of food production capabilities, resources, or anything. They still granted them millions of dollars. The other thing is, this is a, as simple as it gets from an oversight perspective. When you look at the numbers of people, I think out in Wilmer, there was one or two different entities in the city of Wilmer that was feeding more than the number of children that exist in the city. When they look at the, the checks and balances, they were making up names. If you saw, they, they were using some internet random name generator to create the, gen, create the names of the kids they were feeding. In one of those, one of those in, in the federal investigation, I think there were 25 students or 25 names who matched the school roster for the, the region in which they were applying this. 
This is outright blatant theft from the very beginning. And they did nothing or very little in little to uh, stop it. When you look at when you look at what they did, uh, they said they discovered it. Well, I would imagine you discovered when you look at the sheer volume of who the people were, the number of meals they were supposed to be served and what the heck, a what infrastructure it would take to distribute a quarter of a billion dollars worth of meals. They had none of it. None of that infrastructure existed. And when I look at it, much like all the other fraud, we, you know, from, from I, I just had a health and human services report from the legislative auditor that says $140 million they looked at and they failed most of the, of the kind of oversight and auditing and, and the basic checks so to make sure there's no conflicts of interest. When they saw it, like when they saw it, that feeding the future is billing more than the St. Paul and Minneapolis public schools. Why didn't they say this is just a big old, big old, big old red flag? Yeah, but I think it looks, I think what you'll discover is most of it appears to be almost a friends and family plan, right? right. We're, for, we're for enforcement. And in this case, the attorney general should have engaged immediately um, when was, they discovered. One of them when was they, 10 families. What's that? One of them, it was like six siblings. Yes. Oh, it, yeah. In, they, were all, they were all like one or a year and a half apart in, in ages too. Yes. And, and you That's see crazy. all of it. They, they didn't do the basic things. And so they didn't want to be seen, right? The governor walls had been very quiet on this. He lied on it uh, about what they were required to do by the judge. When they went to the judge or when the judge... Um, sought or they sought to, to stop the, the uh, feeding. And when they get sued, think about the emboldenedness. These, this organization knows they were stealing hundreds of millions of dollars and they had the nerve to sue the government to continue payments for services they're not providing. Mm -hmm. the, the Department of Education on that court case they said, right, the response to the judge that said, wow. well, these, these nonprofits were in good standing. They had an opportunity to present their case. This, it was in good standing? I don't think you could say that about anybody involved in this, that they could be deemed in good standing. And so then they lied about who required or that they were not required to restart those payments. And you know, every one of those dollars, the vast majority, they're gone. They're not going to be able to recapture them. And then yeah. think about the basic ace to, to okay, stand out. That, if, if, the, if, the, if, if the most of the money is gone, what will happen to these fraudsters? Um, well, at the federal level, it looks like they're, they're going to be going to prison. They've, they've been indicted, right? So now they'll, they'll be going through lengthy trials. Um, but when you look at it, they, they failed. They, they have they've found very few, if any, invoices where they even purchased food to serve to right. other people. And so I think there's going to be a lot of people going to prison. And of course, any, any resources so let's just that say, they- let's just, say, let's just say for $10 million, for how many years do you think he'll, they'll go to prison? Oh, I, I think they're looking at five plus years, you know, um, and, and or more. And- That's it? For $10 million? Yeah. I, I don't know what it'll be. I think the panel, I think the opportunity could be far. Would make $10 million in five years? Oh, no, no, no. So uh, let's just hope Jeez. they go to prison. Let's hope they go to prison. I think there's, thank God it's at the federal level because there's a chance they're going to go to prison. And, but think about in our Minnesota courts, um, ties into our later conversation about crime, but our Minnesota courts, they're, they'd be unlikely in Minnesota state courts, they'd be unlikely to see any jail term, period. They're not putting people in jail for violent crimes against people, uh, more or less the, what they would consider a white collar crime. Man, that so, is very unfortunate. That, that's, that's some weak rules. If they if somebody's going to steal $10 million and all they're going to serve is four to five years. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what it is, but a, let's hope a it's lot of meaningful. Take risk and yeah. frauding, frauding more. But look at look at the people. Look at the the people who were involved in this. Many of them were on government benefits and went and suddenly became a multimillionaire. That's real. I mean, that's that's just theft. It's theft of vital resources to take care of our children. 
vital theft of resources to take care of our disabled, our elderly, everybody in there. That's theft. And, and it has a real impact on real people. And But for the agencies to willfully allow this, it's such scale. If you read some of the information, because the the Department of Education wasn't acting quick enough, the, the chief of uh, feeding our future, they entered into an agreement that they must prosecute, process their applications in a more expedient manner. So the wow. agency for for just decided to to make that agreement, and and maybe they shouldn't be processing them as quickly as they should because they should have been doing their due diligence across the board. That's what they were there for. They have an obligation, and they hid behind. Well, this is an emergency. We had all people starving out there and and under COVID, they weren't able to do these things. Well, I'm sorry, it's their job. State law requires it, federal law requires it. It's the fundamental basics and they failed. And they failed numerous times across many programs. Governor Walls knows it, Keith Ellison knows it, all of them know it. The commissioner of Department of Education, and heck, I'd throw in there, Department of Health and Department of Human Services. This is occurring across the board on a regular basis. So what what happens now? Now we know that the FBI is handling it now. They're, they're getting caught. But those criminals, you know, unfortunately, it looks like they're only going to get four to five years. Well, that what about that they don't. That let it happen for this money that we're not going to recover? And... The Judge Guthman, he came back, he fired back, and he said he never issued in order for the uh, the education department to continue the payment. So yeah. the judge, Ace, it looks like the judge is free because they never found the issued order from the judge. Ace, it was unprecedented for a judge to come out and basically say, hey, the governor lied, Keith Ellison lied. And the only way to stop these things or to... to, um, to to put focus on it and redirect those resources so they actually do their job is you need to re- unelect Governor Walls, Keith Ellison. They all need to be replaced because they they know what's going on and they need to build in the accountability and ensure that we are complying with state law and we're preserving every one of those dollars. Those dollars come out of your wallet, right? They come out of everybody, every single person that lives in this country. It's coming out of your wallet and they should respect that and they've failed. And again, this is just one program. Ace, this, if you listen to, to Wuger, he is for part of the uh, um, attorney general's office um, at the federal level. But if you look at, listen to Wuger, the $250 million is just the floor. That's where they're at today in the investigation. There's another $250 million that they have to go out and check to see and verify how far does this go? Who else is involved? And they're going to do it. It appears I'm, I'm kind of shocked they're actually prosecuting it. Um, and thank God they are. But they're doing it because Minnesota, the Walls administration, Attorney General Ellison, they didn't want to be seen prosecuting these Somali businesses who are stealing by the hundreds of millions. They didn't want to be seen. And they've continually done this across all opportunities because they're their fear of being called racist. And in fact, I think that's what they've implied every time. Um, you know, if you look at all of the other people involved, did you look into see how many of these people that were involved made maximum contribution uh, donations to uh, oh, their yeah. favorite elected all officials? All yeah, it just happened to be all Democrats from the mayor's yeah. office in Minneapolis, uh, Jamal some, some, Osman. Some of them are your fellow senators. Yes, it, and I think I think uh, uh, they, Senator Fate. Fate has t- eleven of those people <laughs> made donations. Has a thousand dollars from all of them. Yeah, Almost all of them. And that's and that's just eleven of them that we know about. And so then I think two of the I believe two of the um, two of the people who are indicted are also his cousins. And then you go to Jamal Osman, you know, it's, uh, I thought I read that three of the people that he brought in to be key advisors in the city of Minneapolis leadership, um, are all three indicted, you know, Jamal Osman himself. 
he one of the nonprofits that he founded, and he supposedly signed over to somebody else and had no idea what they were going to do with it. Um, they were indicted, and he hasn't been indicted yet. Hopefully, so you think because this this is you know it's all like democratics, you know, so many Democrats, the officials, the business people, they're also involved in it, like. In terms of just getting a little bit of cut of this cheese, this two hundred and fifty million, I, <laughs> they all got tiny cut from it. So, I, you think they are they going to all gonna, FBI going to look into all of them? Uh, I I believe uh, it, it looks like they're going to look into all of them. And think about this: when these, why would they willfully ignore this or allow the ineffectiveness of government? That's that's one way to get the money. But the this is willful, um, willful. Um, non-prosecution, right? They've they've done everything they could to make sure that they were not going to be the prosecutors. And I think, I'm even shocked that they called anybody out. I am assuming the Department of Education acted because of some whistleblower of some sort that that this is going to hit the news and they had to look like they were going to do something without actually doing anything. And, but look at the cycle. They, they feed, they throw these hundreds of millions of dollars out in the cities of St. Paul, Minneapolis, right? They want to buy vote loyalty, voting loyalty, and they know those dollars come back. Not only that, in the, in the, uh, the efforts, the volunteers or not pay, not volunteers when you're feeding, feeding these nonprofits, they go out and campaign. They're being paid with our dollars. These dollars clearly are coming back into their coffers through their election campaigns. Right. And what other ways are they coming through? You know, they know that the willful ignorance to, to allow this to occur and remember, this isn't just the only program. This is one where it's absolutely the most egregious. Um, I think that they're pretty comfortable that they were not going to be prosecuted or even investigated, nor prosecuted. And nobody in Minnesota actually did anything. They pushed it off, probably reluctantly, off to the federal government. And they're actually doing something. And I'm actually kind of surprised they are. Because it, they know, right, even at the federal level, it, it was just o- a lot. It's just too hard to hide. Where's Ilhan Omar in this, right? Those are, she spoke favorably. She's on, on re- record of feeding our future in the videos. Right. She really supports these people. They all know. It, it, to say know. you don't know what's well, going on. Her district is to remain the poorest in the state. And, yeah. uh, however, Ilhan Omar is now worth a $3 million. Yeah. So you you that, look at the... the unfortunate case on that. Yeah. <laughs> But, but you look at them, they're all tied to a very select group of elected officials, and they are working will, willingly and hand All of them are eating at the expenses of the poor. Absolutely. And, and they're making a promise to the poor. Absolutely. I, again, dependency is their fuel. And so you look at it from the school system, right, all the way through the entire process. How do we keep this victimhood mentality and that it's somebody else um, being the oppressor. And the reality is it's the very same people. I've, I've said forever, Ace, none of us, none of us, so mo- practically most of us um, never plan to be in these offices. But you go out there and, and you, mm-hmm. you become vocal because you want accountability and transparency in your government. When you see these things occurring, it's crazy and disgusting, you know? And, and then when you see the life cycle of, how it feeds itself. And, and I've said forever, there's more people working to keep those they claim to support the most impoverished than those of us working to provide opportunity to achieve greatness. And that truly does still exist in this country, right? Mm-hmm. It really does. But when you There's get in there... You know, you know what's the, so sad about this thing when you kind of deeply look at it is that... They were all registered as 501c3, right? They're not even registered as private LLC. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. that. That's the that's the whole government industry. That it's it's the dependency industry. It's what it is. It's very very large. Ace, there are hundreds of nonprofits in St. Paul, Minneapolis, in the big metro areas, Duluth. You pick up pick any of those uh, largely right. blue cities. It's a, literally an industry. Right. That very little, very few of those dollars actually touch the people of need, or at least the the defined people of need, and 
And I don't know that there's been an improvement in any statistical category of the area they're attempting to resolve, right? Think about it. Helping I, I, at the international level, they call it these organizations. You know, they organize themselves at an international level too. This, this is what they stole the locally. These people are like explaining it to international with that money. What do you think they're gonna do? And they say they went to Turkey and Kenya and Ethiopia. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so, so and this is what they called over there. They called uh, non-government organizations, right? NGOs. Yep. Yep. Now, how are they non, non non-government or how are they even non-profit if these people are gonna make that much money? It's they cannot be non-government because their funding comes from the government. It is, and it's just a term. Like it it two hundred and fifty million dollars. That's the government money. Yeah, and and they call them NGOs, right? They they become an operating arm of the government in many cases, right? They're doing the work, typically the work that a private sector wouldn't do, right? Or there's no revenue um, side of it. But they've become an industry living off um, dependency, right? And they feel it. All government wins. All government wins at every level. The more people they have dependent, they need more jobs, and more only people. Thrive in a in a big government where yep. big government has killed all the private industries and yep. all these nonprofiters at the expenses of saying, "I'm going to serve you, the poor." We'll eat and we stay poor. Yep. And they have no accountability, Ace, at any level. And again, tell me one area where they've improved on any of the programs in which they've created, they, they haven't. There's been, in fact, all of them have grown in need because of the very um, behavior and how the monies are spent, right? There's some good, don't get me wrong. There's great you know, people out there. You know there. what's so similar to, to, to Ethiopia about a big government like this, about somebody who wants to be a dictator and run it by himself? In Ethiopia, yep. the current prime minister wrote a book and how everybody can be only one party, his party. And it's great for Ethiopia because everybody's under his party. <laughs> now, yep. to sell this book to the population. <laughs> and, and Ace, what they're he trying took, to do, you He took look $20 at, million dollars from the Oromia Region Education Fund account. Yep. To sell yep. his book. He took money out of the Oromia Education account. Yeah. You look so at it all over. When you get a giant government, you have no say. He can spend your children's money on anything he wish. Yeah. Look at look what happens. Look what's happened today with the willful withholding of information, the lack of transparency of our government and their desire when they claim to be very tolerant, but they don't appear to be very tolerant in thought that differs from theirs. And it's like in this world, they're not, it's not about we are free to agree with us. You're free to think independently in this country, and you should have healthy skepticism. Now, if you have healthy skepticism of government, you're somehow a radical. Give me a break. Right. You know, that's that's a core of our country. Healthy skepticism, trust and verify, and our government should be accountable and transparent. And this this administration, the Walls administration, remember, I, I think earlier, maybe we weren't recording yet, but Governor Walls won't meet with most elected officials. I have been unable to get a meeting in four years with Governor Walls. I'm a state elected official. Okay, in many style. cases, that's it's <laughs> crazy. Just like, that's what the prime minister does. He got this other party, right? They have zero power. He doesn't talk to them. <laughs> but here's the reality is he doesn't meet with most of his Democrat elected officials either. And so he's a very, very small group of people. And it's those that are driving all of this, all the division, all the re-racialization of this country, you know, and, and selling the victimhood. And look what's happening. Crime is going out of this world, right? The, the economy and schools, all of those things are failing miserably. And it's hurting the absolute people that they claim. And I say they claim to support the most, right? They talk about they want to support the, the minority population. Yeah, we want to support everybody. We want to make sure everybody has the greatest opportunity. It's their mantra. And everything they do absolutely hurts that population the most. Absolutely does. And, and uh, education or, or whatever, every one of them. But in this case, think about that $250 million. 
They will recapture what they can, right? They've frozen whatever assets they can get a hold of. They'll, they'll, they'll go out and try to recover as much as they can. But you know, and I know, that most of those dollars are gone. And the ability to recover... Dollars to mansions. Those realtors yeah. got paid. Like, those people didn't know this, this was a corruption money. So they were just well, doing their about, own job. So all those private businesses cannot really give the money back because... It, it. it goes even a little bit further. Let's go back to the beginning where there are investigations. You know, when you go to the bank and, and all of these, we, we, I, know there's, I know there's portions of the population that used to not, from a religious perspective, not do banking. Well, today you're doing banking in this country. Um, sure. There's no way you're receiving a government payment without having a bank account. Right. And so you have a bank account, but you know, if you have a cash, tra a transaction over $10,000, those right. are to be remitted, right? There's a, it's called the yeah. cash transaction report at the banks. So what did those look like? They also have a suspicious activity report, right. you know, and, and even, even at a basic level, how many of the people here were receiving government benefits from an entitlement who were now receiving millions of dollars from their business mm -hmm. come on that doesn't happen you know so there's a whole host of those things that um should have raised many red flags um what about the bank industry and i actually have questions about that did the bank industry are they afraid of being called racists too is that why they didn't did they did they submit them i want to see those i want to right. know that every single cash transaction report because you know we have the Hawala process too as well, right? So to be able to move money in large cash don don denominations through the Minneapolis-St. Paul airport, I have been trying for the last eight months. So Ace, do you remember the child care fraud investigation in 2017? Yeah. yeah. So it was purported probably $100 million. And this is insiders said, ah, they think there's $100 million in theft in that child care. Again. Oh the very same population and the very same people were involved in it. And, and at that time, somebody provided the number of the, the, the dollars going through Minneapolis, St. Paul. At that time in 2017, it was $100 million in cash that went through Minneapolis, St. Paul Airport. Wow. And what does that look like today with the theft of $250 million from a just in a small handful of people. How did those dollars get out? How did they get out of this country? And how much today? What's that? They collect them all in like 19 months, man. It happened so quick. Oh, yeah. And what's that total dollar? I can tell you, not a single entity, legal entity that has, you know, you have to do those, all those dollars are declared to the MSP through this Hawala process. Nobody will cough up what those dollars are today exactly. i think we'd be i think we'd all be shocked because this theft that's occurring from our government is not limited to this 250 million dollars it's happening every day across the whole variety of programs medicaid medicaid as a consumer medicaid equipment medicaid transportation adult daycare child daycare all of them still have it's crazy and, mark we're, we're gonna move on to the second topic too but excellent Go ahead. You got something to finish? Go ahead. Finish. No, no. I, I, it's excellent. The, 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 the string. Well, I what people... have a closing question for you on this one, though. Yeah. But, uh, uh, Abu Abagada, you know, sometimes I post a comment from the viewers, so that way I, I get to engage them that way, too. So he says, how can they recapture back these $250 millions? If these money is gone, what is going to happen to those scammers? Are they going to be put behind bars for the rest of their life? Abdul, we talked about this a little while ago. But, you know, there is like 50 of them and it's more than 50 down the line they're going to bring in. But it looks like they all average about about 8 million, 7 million, 10 million uh, a piece. And Amy, Amy might average like very high. But so for 8 to 10 million, Mark, thanks. You, you think about four to five years, right? We don't really know well, yet. Ace, I don't know if it's four to five years. That should be the minimum for anybody involved in this. So right. hopefully they get much longer terms. But with that, 
Since they have, have a lot of Democrat friends. We think, uh, <laughs> and and think about what they've done, right? Prosecutors and judges. That's why they didn't pursue this in Minnesota. And in the Minnesota um, controlled um, investigation and oversight in the judicial side, they didn't do it. And so it's at the federal level. Thank God they're doing it. Um, there's going to be many more people. They will recapture every asset they can find. And, and we do have, I don't know um, all of the opportunities, but they will find them uh, no matter where they are around the world um, for a crime this large. They will likely be uh, um, finding these people for the next few years who have fled the country um, hiding from this theft. So I, I, I'm confident um, that the Luger is on it and uh, that they're going to be they're going to see many more people. So for sure, for sure. Mark, last question as a solution. You know, I always talk about problem and then I don't leave until I, I touch on the solution. So right now. Uh, the mansion, the Democrats got the mansion, meaning they got the governor. Yes. And they also got the house, right? They do, yes. And we have the Senate. Correct, by one vote. Just by one vote, that's a difficulty, yeah. And that's unfortunately the difficulty. So, what are you guys going to do to fight them on this, to make the rules maybe stronger? Like, what is the Senate thinking about this? Yeah, well, I think I think across the board, people need to realize that um, this environment has been created. Um, the lack of prosecution of all types of crimes across the board lay at the governor's feet. He has chosen to do nothing about it. It falls on the attorney general and it's time for change. And for us, um, we're going to do everything we can to win back and make sure we have the majority in the Senate, take the House. And, and it's really about oversight. Many of these things, how do we embed that oversight? I chair the Legislative Audit Commission that actually is the only entity that um, that oversees the legislative auditor, which does um, does that type of auditing in state government. They are the only entity who audits state government. And so okay. I look at the it. Senators in there, right? What's the that? Audit committee. What, what was that, Ace? The state senators are in one of that committee, right? That, uh, that committee, the Legislative Audit Commission, is six uh, representatives, six senators, and the legislative auditor, not the state auditor, the legislative yeah. auditor actually reports to the legislature. Okay. I will likely bring forth a bill to add um, additional resources. And we're going to have to put a full-time team um, looking at all of those elements of compliance on all entitlement programs on an ongoing basis. I've already had the framework been working on for the last year and a half, two years. Um, we, we need to do things that we've never done before and maybe provide some oversight um, committees and just and try to pull back the control because the, the government entities themselves, not the executive branch, the governor or his appointees, sure. this is embedded in the operational side of government, the full time state employees. They are choosing they choose what they what they want to enforce, what they don't. They also choose what they they uh um, to write rules. They do these rulemaking um, uh, procedures where they're technically writing law. We have to remove, we have to pull those back. Those things should not be done and created by unelected people. That should be back at the legislature. So your voice is heard and we're the ones who represent everybody's voice at the legislature. They've removed us in so many ways. And you can see the gross overreach in their power either willfully or incompetently allowing these things to occur on a For continuous sure. basis. For sure. Please connect me to an, uh, if you're in that committee, we'll, we'll keep following up together then. If you're not on that committee, please connect me to somebody on that uh, committee. I'll be on that. I'm the chair of that committee right now. I will be on that committee um, as we move forward. The chair will go back to the House. The, it goes back from the House and the Senate every two years or every legislative session. Um, it's it's a it's a great committee, but it is about um, the legislative auditor and making sure they have the resources to really go and dig in. In fact, what you'll see is one of the because of the things we talked about, it's really in the grant programs. Um, the legislature directed the legislative auditor to go after um, three large grants. So there a report's going to come out in March 
about the operational aspects of feeding our future, the Southwest right rail, where we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that in these grant programs. And so they're gonna have a very detailed report about what they did or didn't do in the operational compliance um, as it relates to state law or otherwise. That report, part of that's being done right now. And those reports, those investigations typically take a year um, and so, and I know the legislative auditor, they get, they work hand in hand. If they suspect fraud, um, you know, they work hand in hand with the federal investigators, FBI, BCA, um, they do that on a regular basis. So we have a lot of work to do about how we, how we define and maybe, maybe provide some additional resources for that legislative auditor to auditor to really focus on this grant program and maybe restructure the agencies or all agencies um, to provide, you know, separate structure for those that do grants. We have to have that insight. And, and rarely is the legislature provided with the great detail of how they issue those grants. We're going to really need to look. It's, it's, it's billions of dollars over a biennium every year <clears throat> or every, every biennium. So, so <clears throat> just in case, Mark, just in case, you know, when people do these kind of, the scams and frauds, they usually be giving each other gifts. According to the FBI reports, there was a lot of jewelries bought. There was a lot of vacations been taken. A lot of nice cars been purchased. So let's just say the Department of Education Secretary is getting some jewelry from these Feeding the Future Associates. Who can fire him? Can the Senate yeah. fire him? Can the House fire him? Can the oh. government fire him? So the uh, state employees are state employees, but the agency head, the commissioner of the commissioner of the Department of Education or any commissioner um, that falls on the Senate. I think we removed three commissioners, um, which is almost unprecedented because yeah. of their lack of failure or their willful um, desire to implement their political agenda outside of state law. Right. and outside of the legislature. So we got rid of three of them, MPCA, um, Department of Labor and Industry, and uh, I forget. Um, can't you guys, can't, can't the Senate bring him in for a testimony and twist his arm yeah. and, and, and find out if, who's lying, the, the judge or the uh, governor? Who, he can tell uh, us. The, Ace, Ace, what you'll find out is they're very good. They're professional diverters. They They tell you very little. In fact, I would argue almost exclusively the leadership that, that the governor has brought in, what they willfully withhold from us is more damaging than the, the lies they tell us. Um, rarely do they provide the information that's public, that's actually by statute should be public data. Um, they willfully withhold that from the legislature. It's one of the things, the fastest growing complaint we have in government today through the legislative auditor, and then there's another process, the administrative law judge process, is public data requests. They just refuse to, they refuse to respond to them. If it doesn't show good, them in good light or they just want to withhold that information, they don't. They, with, they withhold. They don't comply. And, uh, and that's got to stop. That's crazy. That's crazy. Well, Mark, I hope you keep working hard on it, on that issue. Oh, yeah. That because imagine, man, this is East Africa, man. We're really, really oppressed people. We got similar crooks. This is a small percentage of people, not even, it's like 0.005% yeah. ruined our lives in Africa. They yeah. follow us in America and they do the same thing and they give us bad rep in America. And the Democrats here are, are selling the same garbage and it's always under the guise of kindness and compassion. And it's right. neither. It's neither. And, uh, but, but they, they will say many crazy things. It's as if Republicans are going to be the, the uh, the the ones that that are oppressing. Look at every policy. Our policies are about providing you opportunity, the opportunity to achieve. How do we break the barriers? How do we actually go after the root cause of some of the greatest challenges we have? And and nobody wants to do that. They'd rather live off the symptoms of a failed government because it's more profitable. For sure. For sure. Yeah, this definitely contaminated the East African community right. and the community wanted this cleaned up. So yeah, work hard on it. In addition to that, Mark, Minnesota is becoming number one in crime. I think we're hanging out number two. Yeah. So, what are you guys doing in the Senate to resolve this crime issues? Uh, the governor 
and uh, the governor and Keith Ellison, they seem to flourish after crime. Yeah. And now they talk, right? Lip service. They get cheap lip service today. Now they're now they they want to um, focus on crime. Yeah, it's only because it's election season. Think right. about this. Think about it this way. For the last twelve years now, we've had the governors of Minnesota, both Dayton and Walls, talk about the non-prosecution of criminals on a regular basis, um, from closing freeways right under the right to protest. You don't have the right to protest and stop commerce. You don't. We have the greatest opportunity of free speech in the world. You have the right to protest, but you don't have the right to stop com uh, commerce. You don't right. have the right to destroy somebody's property. You don't have, have that right. Home. We were, that has been occurring for the last 12 years. Remember, you might be too young, but they, with Dayton, when they blocked off the freeways, when they closed the airport, they, they blocked everything. And they said, well, the governor actually called for the non-prosecution of these, quote, peaceful protesters. Well, then we go into the, we come all the way into the George Floyd world of the, of the other violent protests and burning the country, burning hell, half the country down. Right. Um, very few people were prosecuted, right? right? If we looked, if you would have looked at the crime map, our crime maps were on a hockey stick growth, pretty steady growth. Right. With the George Floyd event they that crime if they actually prosecuted people for the the amount of violent crime that hockey stick it would have went from a hockey stick growth to straight north but they didn't very few people have been prosecuted across the entire country for Mark, burning down these countries and looting and stealing Mark, and then especially you're with the minorities i don't know after george i don't know why we vote for for the Democrats after George. Yeah. Mark. They will they willfully let your vital resources burn city that council, serve you. City council of the city George Floyd got killed in the city of Minneapolis. Yep. They were all Democrats. There's only one independent there. Yep. The rest of them are all Democrats. Yes. The city, and mayor, they, is, the city mayor is a Democrat. Same party. Yep. The county attorney is a Democrat. Same party. Yep. Look what the they've done, rep, Ace. The House rep from that district is a Democrat. Yep. The state house rep is a Democrat. The state senate is a Democrat. The federal, Congress, the federal Congress, congresswoman is a Democrat. Is a Democrat. The governor is a Democrat. Yep. The state attorney general is a Democrat. From top to bottom, we elect everybody Democrat from one party. And George got killed like that. They refused to yep. prosecute. They and, used them to take the White House to right. play American racism like that. Yeah. And and think about who they're blaming today. They're blaming the systemic whatever. They're blaming everyone else. There's been no influence of a diverse opinion or thought in that entire community in 35, 40 years. So who is it to blame then? They're it. Right. They keep looking at it for the man. They is the man. And they're they're the ones causing it. So when they and 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 this whole garbage of uh, the systemic uh, racism, right, racism and bias, it exists across everybody. It doesn't it doesn't matter what your melanin content is. Right. None of those. It doesn't matter. And except for in this environment, if that exists, mm -hmm. think about the education system. Those who are running the government, those are embedded in it they would be the purveyors of it. I think they should all resign. I Mark, do. I think they should resign. Mark, um, as, a, as, a, as a new immigrant to America, man, it's, every year it's, it's, it's kind of gets me a little bit sad in, sad in Minnesota. Yeah. The, way, the way the government is looking is slowly acting like a third world government. Like constantly, mm -hmm. slowly, slowly acting like a third world government. When I went back to Oromia, like I went back to the village that like, classic places and sure. you will you will see like huts huts built from like the 50s and the 60s right like strong huts like giant like they're big like really big giant really strong and the current matter one they're building for themselves is like so tiny so just little crap like the woods they're using they're not even like spending craft on it yeah. Like, how can time ago, like, 
that older ago, the people were putting that kind of work into the house they want to live in. And now they're not building these houses and they're expecting the government to, to build America model. Right. Like America model. So the government has to build it. People are not going to build their own homes anymore. Like liberalism hit yep. Oromia since 1990, like so bad that yeah. the Oromo people inside Ethiopia are not looking to themselves. They're looking to the government for every solution. Right. And yep. everywhere and around the world where you see the biggest crime, the biggest genocide, the biggest oppressions, everywhere around the world, that government is really big. That government is in control of everybody's all aspect of their life. Yeah. And that's how the government is in Ethiopia right now. It, big government and, in charge of everything. And look what they're doing here. They're trying to kill as much as they talk about, it, they're trying to kill individual home ownership and the opportunity, right? right. And for high high rise, constant consolidated apartment buildings, where you won't own anything, and they want you to be happy not owning anything. They want you to be happy when they'll determine, eh, you know, what energy you get to have, how much energy, when, how much you should heat your place. Maybe even with the, not solely due to electric cars, but. They can decide, they just plan on, well, we might not have enough energy. You're just going to drive less. You know, those are all attacks on the freedom and the dream of America. It's really hard to hold down the immigrant spirit, right? Because right. you come from th those first generation, the fr not first generation, but, but those foreign born, much like my ancestors, I'm third generation U.S. born. We aren't that far apart, right? right. And so... Um, it's hard to hold it down because you've actually been closest to what real oppression is. Or when you think about, you actually remember having to work for food. Right. We haven't had to work for food in this country in 70 years, right? We haven't had a hardship that brings us back. Um, this, these vast, these good times leads to vast prosperity, which builds weak men. And then government becomes that attractive um, alternative. And it's right. not hard. It's just the human spirit. Ace, if you kept getting paid a great wage or you got you got by and you, you don't have to worry about your housing, you don't have to worry about your, your food expense, most people wouldn't work if they didn't have to. But that's no. that's an attack on the human spirit. It's but when, they sell on, it, when they sell it, it looks just like heaven on earth. Oh, yeah. But I it's an attack on the human I spirit. I want everything I, I wish for. You know, everything yep. I want, I just get it just like I'm in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. And is it is it what we all aspire to? No. And but if it if you, again, have multiple generations of the dependency, it is their only normal. Right. It is the only thing, you know. And then when you keep selling this victimhood mentality that somebody else caused you to be here, but come to us, we'll take care of you. Sure. It, it's oppressive, but it's also really bad for the human spirit. The right. the the desire to dream and, and to be taught to prosper that self-worth is what's built this country and what's really has made it's still the greatest country in the world. For sure. And and then the, the lack of uh, social health, right? When we are now trying to separate people, isolating people for the last couple of years, we're social beings for our mm -hmm. own mental health. We require it. Well, not only it for maybe our biological health, and, and, but our mental health in every aspect of what is then community. Um, they're trying to tear every, every piece of that fabric apart. We're not going to let them, right? Um, but We're they're just taking wrong. advantage. It was real. Yeah. It's easy to fall for a nice thing. Yeah. I'm not telling people nice, fake things. Yeah. We're not promising them heaven on earth. Yeah. I have, I have one of my favorite uh, talk show hosts is uh, um, Dan Bongino. He does a yeah. great job. He's, he's an intense guy, but yeah. his is... His, he's, he's got a simple model, right? It's like the Republicans may not be the cure for all of your problems, but the Democrats are certainly the cause. And, and he's right. <laughs> so they couldn't do more harm to this country in their policies if they tried. And that's what we keep fighting every day. And, and think about in the Minnesota Senate that we've had one vote. Think about what your gas tax would look like alone without that one vote in the Minnesota Senate. They would have already had an additional 20 cents a gallon. It right. would have gone up in addition to the 28 cents is already there. Right. It would have gone up another 20 cents. They would have put an inflator on it. People don't realize that, but they wanted it to a, an inflator that rises annually. Right. Then 
Today, they are doing um, rulemaking because they also adopted California clean cars. Now they're doing California clean fuels. Right. That will add another 30, 40 cents a gallon because of that regulatory requirement. Ace, every Minnesotan would be paying a buck a gallon more just for Minnesota taxes and regulations. Can you so afford that? It made a difference to have that one majority one, over. One seat. Absolutely. So um, we want people to be able to afford to live. We live in the greatest country with the greatest amount of natural resources. And we saw, right, under good policies that talk about good, clean, reliable energy, we can be that self-reliant, self-sufficient energy producer. And it's the lifeblood for everything that we do and everything we require for our subsistence. Food, think about petroleum products, Ace. There's hundreds of byproducts that you use every day um, sure. and precious metals. They don't want to do any of it. And if we can't mine for precious metals here, if we can't drill for oil and natural gas safely here, if we can't do it here, it can't be done safely anywhere else in the world. Right? So, yeah. so in, 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 in these legislations, when you guys debate, Sometimes the Democrats say electric car or electric car, right? <laughs> Have they figured yeah. out what to do with the battery? Do you guys ask them what we're going to do with the battery? They, Ace, Ace, here's the problem. You and I and so many others um, think logically. And, and there's solutions to all of it. This is more religion-like, right? Think about climate change. The climate has changed forever. Um, do we want clean air? Heck yeah. Clean air, clean water. We've done that. Do you know anybody, Ace, that doesn't want a great fuel-efficient car that looks great and performs great? I don't know anybody who doesn't want one. They're building them. The natural market is working well. Electric Mark, cars. I bought, a, I, I bought a hybrid car. Yeah. Yep. They asked me $8,000 for to replace the battery. Yep. Yep. And then so, they asked me five, $500 to dispose the battery. Right. Yeah, so, and, and, and the precious minerals required, Ace, for everyone. There aren't enough precious minerals in the world. And our electrical grid, uh, remember, it would be one thing if you were growing your power generation exponentially. Because everything we do is going to require more and more electricity. Just the, think about everything you have today that now consumes electricity on a 24-hour basis in your own home, right? So then you think about, Power is our lifeblood. So we, heck, Minnesota used to be really, really competitive in power for industry. Right. One, do you know, Ace, one mine in Minnesota, one mine in Minnesota consumes 320 megawatts of power seven days a week, 24 hours a day. It's more than the city of Minneapolis. Right. So the energy costs for them, like paper mills, we only have one paper mill left in the state. They left. They cannot afford to do business in this state. We lose as taxpayers and we lose as a nation. The, the, the mining, the precious metals for the windmills and computers and all those things. You can't have everything we have and not mine for those precious metals right here. We're sitting on billions of dollars of precious metals in northern Minnesota. Um, but we need power. Electric cars, I, for people that want them, great. I don't know many people who can afford it's them. It's still in trial. It's been over 30 years in trial. They have not resolved yeah. it. Mark, well, Mark, I, if I buy a car, Mark, especially brand new, I'm going to drive to the Grand Canyon. I'm going to drive around. I'm going to drive somewhere. I'm not going to freaking keep on renting cars if I have a brand new car, right? <laughs> I don't want to be yes. in the middle of the highway and the battery dies on me. Or Ace. Pull over to the next gas station, plug it in, and sleep at a gas station for two hours for the car to charge. Right. right. Do that it, on the road. And the infrastructure to do that, it would take, it'll take time. And some of that's coming. But the, I think, our, I think the, the car and the ability to, and freedom to move is as much of the American culture as anything we have. Ace, if you want to drive across country with a five-minute refueling, you can do that. Yeah. Uh, heck, I think on an average vacation, 38 million people hop in their cars and travel across exactly. the country. And not just our commute, what we do locally. Um, 
it now is. we'll have to pull up to rest area like like truck stoppers and sleep in our little cars. You you and then the, and then Ace. So what where the do you? Car charges for two three hours. Ace in Minneapolis, right? Minneapolis is moving to high density housing. Where will those chargers exist? Because they're not even requiring the apartments now to have parking spaces. Right. Right. The average average American family has a couple cars. Right. Um, where are you going to park them? Where Where would a fueling station be for St. Paul, and Minneapolis? When for out of town residents, right. where would that be? The acreage, the space, and the time required. Um, it works for some people. It does. They're, I, I hear they're great cars, probably really cool to drive. But it might be just a short term solution until you get the hydrogen. Exactly. You know, which we need a lot of power to be able to do all of those things to make sure we have clean transportation and, and, uh, and, we have the ability to live and afford our food, right? Think about the transportation costs today, Ace, on this movement to, to electric cars. The the trucking industry or California, we adopted California clean cars. They did it without the legislature. They want to tell you, they want to tell manufacturers what cars they have to sell. So they might tell Ford, you have to sell 7% of your cars have to be electric. And the reality is, they don't care whether they sell. They can't force you to sell something that nobody wants. Right. And, and so if they don't, it's like everything else. It's like carbon credits and all those things. In right. their world, it's okay to pollute in their I world. It, I call as, it corruption credits. Yeah, as long as you pay more, more federal taxes or state taxes, it's okay for you to pollute. Right. Because n- paying more taxes doesn't eliminate right, pollution. Um, so, so yeah, they, they don't care and you get tied up and, and many get tied up. There are solutions for all of these things, but adopting Minnesota or California's clean car is, uh, fuel standards. And now California is implementing for commercial trucks. For sure. If you want to see every single product you have, keep attacking the energy sector, keep attacking the petroleum sector and this inflation will be long-term inflation and middle income and low income families are going to be crushed. And look what's happening. Our restaurant, there's more restaurants and and those things are closing today. They're continuing to go. They can't operate the margin, the the cost, labor, people aren't working, you know, because life's too good. They're being paid. They're, they're figured out how to eat without participating in the workforce like they used to. Right. It's, it's going to have devastating impacts on the entire country and, we got to get out of this. We got to have good energy, reliable, clean. Um, but we need a lot more of it, and we need to be that energy um, producer and leader across the world. They're they're killing inspiration at every level, Mark. Absolutely. Education. Talk to me, Mark. In Minnesota, there are too many youth, too many preschoolers on a waiting list. We have yeah. this much surplus. We have the education budget. Why are the Democrats not getting these kids into a classroom? Yeah, when you look at the, uh, in, well, in fact, the public school enrollment's been dropping pretty significantly because of everything that they've done over the last, you know, now it's culminated over the last 10, 15 years. When you look at the outcomes, we, in, in think about, I look at where we're at today is we're now starting to reap the benefits. I don't think they're mm-hmm. benefits. But in 2013, the Democrats had full control of the House, the Senate, and the, and the governor's office. Mm-hmm. And they removed graduation standards. Do you know we don't have graduation standards for you to get a diploma in Minnesota? And look what they've done. Yes. And they've done it. Uh, and, it and again, many of it's, I think it could be being, deemed very racist. They've removed and lowered the standards because of the equity or the, the, uh, the performance gap between young black and brown children, right? It's the worst in the nation under the very same people who led all of it. And, and so what do they do by lowering the standards? They guarantee that those kids are not going to get an education. When you set the bar so low and you're telling somebody based on the melanin of their skin that they're unable to receive or obtain an education to be successful, that's garbage. That's pure garbage. And they don't want to go after the root cause. We need to find, right? We need families. We need to make sure I, and support. Yeah, yeah. And, and you, then also, man, so many, so many great people resigning 
from education services. Yeah. Even, even Coach McKenzie from North Minneapolis resigned. Yeah. They, the, coach resigned because when you see, look what they've done, Ace. Look in the St. Paul, Minneapolis schools. We don't want um, the school resource officers, right? Think about safety and security for your children in the school um, and the violence. They've taken away the control under these stupid policies that don't allow a teacher to intervene or that the teachers, when they're assaulted, they're not provided, you know, this lawlessness is, is kind of permeated those schools. It's just a detriment mm -hmm. to everybody. It's not an, a learning environment anymore. And it's all the same people who've set those policies. And now we've got a, a, the, the garbage content and what they think the school should be providing is from an education perspective. Think about that garbage. And it's not oh, moving man. the needle. It's not moving very, the needle. Very unfortunate. A coach like that, when a coach like that resigns because of... Yeah. The rules the politicians made, and these politicians are Democrat. Yep. That's a black yeah. legendary coach, man. That's a wake-up call to all minorities to vote as strong, to stay conservative, and take care of your community. Otherwise, once they get really big, it's very hard to stop them. It it is. And and you're seeing that push on the on the public school system. So many people have just opted out. They're going to do homeschooling. They're doing small community groups, right? Five parents are getting together and one's teaching once once a week, right? Changing their work habits because the education and, and for homeschooling, look at their performance. They're performing at an extremely high level. And they're doing they're doing it four and a half hours a day. And then they're teaching real life skills on top of it. We, have, we still have the best infrastructure to be able to teach and provide in the public school system, the best education. But, right. but think about it. They're dropping accelerated programs for, for the top performers. Yeah. So they're lowering the standards. And what does that do? That just lowers the performance requirements and expectations for everybody in the school. That doesn't benefit a single person. There is stuff and, that that wants to excel, so it can be equal. They can that doesn't want to excel. We they want equality, and they want that means everybody is going to be equally less intelligent and have a lower grade education. I think you need to address LeBron James. You gotta well, tell him. You gotta tell LeBron James you cannot score more than ten points because everybody else well, gotta get ten points. Why are there not? Um, four foot 10 um, basketball players. Yeah. It would be more equitable, right? Wouldn't that be equity? Every team and, can and only have one guy over, over seven feet. Right. We yeah. got to get all these three feet shorties too. We got to get them in basketball court. Ace, those, if you start to talk about those very policies that they're promoting <laughs> today, and when you apply it to everything else that's not within their political agenda, None of it makes sense and it doesn't and it never will, but it's just a way to divide people, you know, and it's like, and then divide by your melanin, the things you can't control. Um, if you, if you follow education ACE, one of the things that I thought was really cool, um, Carrie Levin did a story on the Lucy Laney elementary school in, uh, in uh, North Minneapolis, lowest performing school in the entire state of Minnesota, right? Mostly black, black and brown, mostly black. And so, but it's a community school, right? That's, I grew up to a community school. You should be going to school with your, your right. kids and friends and family you live with. That's, our schools are actually the foundation for community. But they did a, Maury, Maury um, Fressel, Fresselbean, I think that's how you pronounce her name. She was the principal there at Lucy Laney. She's now the principal at North High. And, but she grew up right in the neighborhood. Uh, her story is kind of amazing, a really hard life, but she made it and she came back to give. Ace, you should watch that. Everybody should watch that. Um, it's sure. a documentary. It's called Love Them First. What she convinced the staff to do is to go out in the summer to find one person who cares about that student, right? Wrap around services to make sure to get that student that someone cares. And then that way that student can be prepared so they can receive an education. That's what we need. We need Maury. We need, we need more Maury's to be able to convince the community that sure. we need people from the community to wrap around because only the community are the ones that are going to be able to hold each other accountable to make sure that mm -hmm. student's ready for school. Right. We also talk about 
healthy male role models for each of those kids that if they don't live with their dad, we need a healthy role model. That's exactly what they did. That school now has a waiting list to get in and their scores are rising and those kids are going to be successful. That's the foundational stuff that we have to kind of blow, not blow up the school system, but right today, it's so restrictive because of the licensure requirements. They limit people's access to these jobs because of licensure requirements and none of them prove that you're going to be a great teacher, right? right? And so you need somebody who cares and we got a lot of great teachers who care, but these root cause issues and mostly St. Paul, Minneapolis, right? Where you have the concentration by, by, by choice um, of the people who need the most help. We have, we have tons of dollars, tons of wraparound services, all those nonprofits we talked about, they're all in St. Paul, Minneapolis. And so there's some cool projects out there. I think that's the type of model we have to really look at and say, we have to go after the root cause. How do we empower people and and make sure that during the summer Mm -hmm. we go out and find community. I'd trade, I'd trade uh, four, four, five, six, 10, whatever it is of those licensed teacher positions For um, for people in the community who care Mm-hmm. who can be the ones to do the wraparound services and go out and do the door knock to find the one person and really can have the conversation about accountability. Because if the community is not going to do it, the teachers sure are not going to, they are not equipped to be the parent, the guardian and the full-time provider for that child, nor do, nor do we want them to be. Um, sure. But when you look at it, you should watch it. It's, it's a really cool documentary. I will, I will Channel, 11, Channel 11 did it. It's called, yeah the Lucy Laney story, love them first. And Uh you'll see there, and it's like, it really depicts the story of of the struggle and the family structure that those kids have. We got to disrupt that, right? We need to make sure they wrap around and and get back to what a kind of a nuclear family looks like. Get a healthy male role model in there Mm -hmm. and make sure mom's good. And and those exist. Nobody wants to deal with it and and really kind of go after the root cause. So um, and then not having graduation standards, Ace. I was in. I was in. Um. I was in. I've got a prison in my district. I've got Rush City Prison, and I asked them because they 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 uh, um. They they are full. One of the very few prisons that are full because they let a whole bunch of people out. By the way, talking about crime, Governor mm-hmm. Walls let a third of the prison population out during the during the pandemic just because mm-hmm. he thought it would be good. Um, yeah. but. But uh, up at the up at the prison, I had just come off a tour of a St. Paul High School where I find out that they don't um, their their grading standards are if you turn your assignment in, you get a four. So you get an A, you get an A just for turning your assignment in. What the heck is that going to do for their educational opportunity? It's nothing. And and so I I went to the prison. So we're talking. They have actually have a, a pretty decent education process, trades, and 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 some training. So they get some skills on the way out. Uh, so I asked the I asked the guy who runs education. I said, how many people in the Rush City Prison actually have a high school diploma or or a, a GED? You have any idea how many people in that prison or a prison that have a high school diploma? I'm hoping at least seventy percent. Actually, 80% have a high school diploma. It was that's much wow. higher than I anticipated. Yeah, that's really but, but when we spoke to them, they said they found out that many of them have a diploma, but most of them don't have an education. So yeah. we've lowered standards that we're giving graduate or high school yeah, diplomas in school G. Just get a name behind the paper. No, GEDs not. without the education. So that's why you have to have standards. And so now that prison system is actually going to look and say, we've got to test everybody to find out where they are academically to make sure that they, when they leave prison, they truly have an education. Right. Um, that's what they should have done in our high schools. Lowering the standards, again, hurts the very people. And, and again, everybody talks about black, brown people. That's who it's hurt the most. Anybody in that socioeconomic status that doesn't have the nuclear family, right? A healthy dad all of them are performing at the same level, right? right? They are. It doesn't discriminate in that in that manner. So we've got to tackle those things. And we have all the programs in place. The problem is it's too profitable getting these kids identified and, and, and from a special needs perspective. Ace, do you know how the St. Paul and Minneapolis have almost twice the school funding of a rural school? 
They do it through they do it through categoricals. They try to get you identified right. and and ID'd as being special needs. Guess who feeds off special needs? And all those same non that we mm-hmm. talked about before. Exactly. They they come in as supposed to be the wraparound service, um, but they're not they're not being successful. They're not improving the outcomes of those children. So and I know exactly uh, what you're talking about, and I've seen them. Call they call this specialist too. They be trying to drive from school to school. Yep. Which hours they waste on the road and just. And what it does is that very it, unfortunate. It opens the door for all of the entitlement service for them to wrap around and get the right. dependency right at the right at the entry into the school system. And and so to me that has to stop because it right. just is a we have we need to have high competitive standards to make sure kids get a good yeah. great education. But look at the garbage they're focusing the on. Most the most important schools. one is man, I, I, keep fighting, man. Keep that the school choices oh. open. Yeah, and we look at today, the school choice, the curriculum. That, must, that one is a must because I have three three kids coming up and they're very athletic. They play sports. You know, awesome. I make them, I'm going to, you know, make them do their homework. You know, they're just starting yeah. public school. So, yeah. It, they're and that's either what it takes. Go to, if, if they're athletic, you know, when they get to high school level, if their athletic is promising, I'm going to get them to the best high school teams. Yeah. Like, you know, I need to have that choice. Yeah. They can and, they can make me stay here. If, if the schools around here don't want to be serious in the sports. Yeah. And that's the part that is that, you know, there's a big, the big tussle um, that we haven't funded school education. We $19 billion of state right. dollars go into the education. Another $6 billion from those uh, just schools assessed through the county property tax. Um, and then there's another billion, I think billion and a half of federal dollars that comes in. Um, that's a lot of money. Right. And, and the more money, and oh, that doesn't count the $3 billion they got during COVID, right, to, to, to not teach students during the pandemic. Right. And, uh, and so there's plenty of money. We've, we've funded them in, you know, pretty significantly over the last six years. The outcomes aren't improving. And okay. so it's not a money issue. It's about the structure and a lot of the things that, you know, creating a healthy, safe environment, having having uh, school resource officers, all those things are required to make sure the kids that want a great education have a safe right. environment to do it. For sure. For sure. Okay, fine. Last one, Mark. Um, election. Let me know, yeah. Mark, why. Why should the minorities vote conservative? Why should we should, why should we vote red, Mark? Yeah, I, I think when you see, we talked a little bit about it. When you look at the policies that Governor Walls act at the federal level and at the state level, literally everyone there is hurting all opportunity for all Minnesotans. You think about the education system we just spoke about. Right. It's been led by the very same people and the outcomes have be, have gone down every every single year. The The focus on everything except providing the opportunity to achieve greatness, right? Everybody has that. True equality is that opportunity, but you can't have, right, equality without, uh, you know, they, they, want, they, want e- they want equity without equal um, input. You have to participate. We ha- you have to participate, and, and it's good for the human spirit, mind, and, and literally your overall health as, as, a, as a human being as you progress through the life cycle. The, when you look at the, um, the policy, ours are about how do we make sure that government isn't taking more of your dollars than necessary, funding critical things in, in government, making sure that, that government is accountable and that we have the monies we need because mon- government doesn't get to make money, at least at the state level, we're not printing our own money, right? right. Um, so <laughs> we need to honor, honor and respect that our agencies are performing um, and making sure they're doing the things necessary um, for the, when it is the role of government. And our job, our goal is to restrain the government to, to make sure it's within its constitutional bounds. It's not the end all be all parent for all people. It's not supposed to be. And you see the oppressive, uh, the policies. Think about all those energy things we talked about. It's going to affect every single thing you buy and consume. They talk about nationally, and our governor supports it. 
right? They want to eliminate oil. Mm -hmm. Well, it is the world consumes 100 billion, 100 million barrels of oil a day. We consume about 22 million barrels of oil a day. Everything you eat is a derivative of it. Everything you consume, everything you wear, your house, your car. Oh, Mark, Mark, it's okay. doesn't exist like, without it. We don't, we don't have to use the oil one in the U.S., but it's okay. We can go drill it somewhere <laughs> else. And it's, that, it's not going to affect the environment if we drill it in uh, Africa or the Middle East or South America, right? Yeah. We're, we're living we're, our own island in the U.S. according to the Democrats. I know. We not pollute our own little island, but we should go pollute. Yeah. China, from China, if they pollute it, it's okay. From Russia, if they pollute it, it's okay. And they can just ship Ch the oil to us. China puts a coal plant online um, every two a week, I believe. A new coal plant. <laughs> so um, is it two weeks? No, I think it's well, 52, nine. Yeah. It's funny. Um, like, almost when, two, almost when Joe two Biden a week. Canceled the key pipe and yep. then <laughs> approved the Russia one. <laughs> yep. Yep. Like, what? And now that one, now the, the Nord that's Stream 2. for the betterment of the environment. He did that for the betterment of the environment. Yeah. So when you, when you look at it, the things that haven't changed that are important, ACE education is really top. Parents want choice. Um, parents don't want the schools indoctrinating. They want them to teach. They're right. They don't want to tell, they don't want them teaching that you're an oppressor or you're being oppressed based on who you are the melanin in your content, they want them to focus on a good core education. It's about safety, right? The safety of all. When you, when you think about, think about St. Paul, Minneapolis and, and it's reaching, it's the safety issue reaches throughout the entire state. It's when you, when you don't prosecute criminals, they become very emboldened and the crimes are everywhere. The scale is different, right? But do you know that, Ace, do you know the carjackings when you read the statistics on carjackings and armed carjackings, the statistics don't go back very far because they were so infrequent, they weren't tracking them. Think about that. If so infrequent, we weren't tracking them. Look what they've allowed that to do without having any penalties. And so crime and safety and then the economy. Um, we're going to focus on making sure that we can do everything we can to make sure you keep as much money as you have create an environment that's good Man, for just, jobs. Just about a week ago, my neighbor walks up and his car, car, car Cadillac converter is gone. Yeah. And, and, but Ace, don't worry. It's we're going to paint, we're going to, we're going to set up a government program and we're going to paint your converter orange. Do you think anybody cares? They're not <laughs> selling these. They're not, it's, it's like the dumbest program in the world. And now they're selling. I, I couldn't believe it when I saw that, when I saw that in, in the reading. Uh, I, the, the, uh, now they're doing, you can get them etched, you know, it's like, nobody cares They They got a black market. It's not going to the, the scrap yards with people have, they've got a black market to sell those precious metals. And so they need to prosecute them, um, for stealing them. Think about it, Ace. Think about Mark, the car. When the guy stores something, 40,000 of them, yep. it's shipping it abroad. It yeah, be it that's exactly it, Ace. So the shipping containers and, and shipping is where they should be tracking them. It's not scrap metal dealers in, in this state or, you know, I don't I doubt it's in any of the of the five state region close to us. But think about your car. They said, well, it's just it's just property. Yeah. But if it's your only way to get to work, right, Ace, somebody steals your car, that's maybe it's eight thousand dollar car, but it's your eight thousand dollar car. Right. And and nobody has a right to that. And again, it hurts the, the middle income and the poorest the most. So they ha we have to get back to, to prosecuting crime and making sure that um, those, because it's, again, a very right. small group of people. Right. My show is like David Letterman's show. Like whenever I talk about the Democrats, everything they do constantly makes me laugh. Let's just say they paint kind of like converter orange, right? Yes. Let's just say, you know, a crackhead, you know, who cut that thing, sold it to me for 40 bucks, and he went and did his crack with 40 bucks. And I put that car, like, converter on my car and fixed my car. Let's just say that. Who's going to go under the hood like that and check if that, that thing is orange or gray? Nobody. How do they, how do they even know it's, it's, it's used on my car part? Nobody, Ace. That, it's, all, it's all to make you feel good in light of actually solving the problem. 
prosecute. And these guys are emboldened, right? They're doing it during the day. They're doing it during the night. They could care less. But even worse, they're stealing your cars. They're doing armed carjackings and still Mark, not having prosecution. This is why I'm sad, Mark. <laughs> like, liberalism took over Oromia like the way it's taking over America right now. Yeah. In the 90s. When nothing took over, like, it's bad, Mark. Like, it's really, really bad. So... Yeah. They told the prime minister now, he literally said every every language is going to be a federal language. And then people are like, where is the budget going to come from? Like, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So like, every time he's, like, everybody loved it. Because they're liberals, they think, like, everybody's language is going to be spoken in the government. It's not possible. Like, yeah. when the president speaks... That means we're going to have like 82 interpreters lined up. Right. And then we yep. have to have 82 different TV screens. Like this stuff is not possible. It might sound good to your ear when he says like, you know, every language is going to be a better language. Like Ace. everybody's fighting. Everybody has different cultures. So they're fighting for their culture. And he Ace. comes and he tells them, you're all going to have it your way. Ace, I, I, I've now. talked about, I've talked about for 35 years. One of the things that they've done in, in Minnesota is think about all the immigrant populations of the past, right? You came here to, for the American G dream, right? right. There, there, aren't, there aren't many people, there are as many people fighting to get in this country, right, as anywhere else in the world, right? There, there's no, no other country that has more people wanting to get here because prosperity is truly available. And, and I've said it forever. You talk about the language, right? A language accommodation, what does it do? it typically prevents assimilation and your ability to thrive within the, within that country. Right. So you, you will adapt. And, but what have we done? Government has said, Oh, wait, look what we've done. We've, we've, we put everything, what, 50, 60, 80 languages today. And then we have a whole school system now um, that, that does English as second language. Remember that's a categorical ACE, more funding more funding for you. And, and the longer you, you don't acquire the language, you'd become vulnerable, right? To those that would uh, prey on you within your own community first, and then your elderly, right? All of those things occur. And so I always do, because I, when I talk to the world in academia, the, those that have college degrees, I always ask them, what's the best way to acquire a new language? And, you know, they just jump to it and say, assimilation. You know, there's a there's a Mandarin Chinese. Uh, immer, um, I'm sorry, um, an immersion school. There's a German one here. There's a, a, a Mandarin Chinese one there. And I said, Yeah, I, I kind of knew that. <laughs> how come it doesn't? Then how come it doesn't work for English? Oh wait, because it's more profitable to take the path we have, and they can create late, longer lasting dependency if you don't adopt the language. Right, first generation. Right, you're going to learn that language but they do everything they can to prevent the assimilation under the guise of kindness and compassion, which it's neither. For sure. Right. So it, it's, it's, sure. it is amazing, but we've seen what it is. You see a socialist behavior, right? That we've seen it fail over and over and over and over. And they just think they called every brand Democrat socialist, a kinder, gentler form of oppression. Right. It's still oppression yeah. and it won't work. And government, um, when they take over the controls and means, productivity and your prosperity go down the toilet. Well, and that's well, not well. what we're, not who we are. Um, but we're at a preface, right? We, we need to make sure that we're focusing and making sure everybody has the ability to live a free life, have the best quality of life, create jobs, have, a, have an environment that becomes tr attractive for people to grow jobs and build jobs and businesses in this state. Um, we truly are. I think we're still one of the best states in the country. We have the best of everything in the world here. We also have all of those threats that we see at the national level, you know, in Congress. I mean, you see, you follow Congress, whatever crazy bill you've heard them pass, there's a version of that, that, that which is passed through the Minnesota House, the Democrat House, and only stopped by the Republicans, <laughs> that, sure. one, that one seat. Um, from elections, you know, laws to changing those things to remove. And so there's no checks and balances to continuing and perpetuating this lawlessness environment we have. 
trying to change the statutes so you don't prosecute qualified immunity. It's only going to lead to fewer and fewer law enforcement. And, and we can't continue. We have to get to the point where that's re- they're respected, that they're high quality, right? They're not abusive, but, and, they, and they're good actors. We can do that. And, and you can have safety in your community and you don't have to worry about, you shouldn't have to worry about random gunfire in St. Paul or Minneapolis. It's, un, it's unbelievable um, that you're supposed to just accept that, you know, and, and you're lucky you didn't get, you didn't get hit by a stray bullet, but you know, it lands somewhere. It's your car, it's your house, you know, and you look at the children that have been killed by random gunfire. It's not a world we, we, we have a choice. And it's not the choice I want to make to that anybody has to live in that environment, nor should anybody, no matter where you live, should never have to live in that environment. And I think that's the difference. The current, the current elected leaders in the Democrat side want to keep that environment and it's 100%. only going to get worse. So 100%. they want to keep us dependent. On Absolutely. Them. We don't want to be like that. So Mark, <clears throat> this is my highlight. And then you can take your last highlight too. And then we close the show. So to my minorities, especially new immigrants, especially those from East Africa, well, particularly the Oromos, like the flag behind me. This is America and this is a country. This got a territory, just like us, the Oromos with Oromia, we got a territory. We're trying to get our country back from Ethiopia so the Oromo people can stop starving and stop getting politically prosecuted by Ethiopia. Every five years, man, they renew prosecution because we, we don't have a true Oromos in Ethiopian politics. So every election, election will come. And millions, 60 million Oromos will want to get out and vote for Oromo politicians. But the Ethiopian government will throw them in jail and only one party will run. So to stop this, that's why people have, to stop this, that's why in America they fought for a smaller government. That's why they gave people the power to own gun because of their freedom of speech. They don't get killed. They can defend it themselves. When we call the police officer, Mark, by the time the police officer gets to the crime scene, the criminal is gone 90% of the time, 99% of the time. They're usually gone. That is why it's important that people defend themselves. That is why people like Mark Corrin, they fight for us in, this, in the government for freedom. Once we're free, we can build the schools for ourselves, especially the Oromo people. You know, every school we built it for ourselves. The Ethiopian government never really built anything for us, nothing. So when an individual is free, he can build himself a nice house, a big house, a small house. If his individual is free, he don't have to cut the tree down. You know, the trees are on our map, Mark. It represents something God made for us. For us to cherish it, for us to cut it down, build a nice house with it, for us to pick up the seed, you know, plant another tree. God didn't make the tree for me to just hug all the time, 24 hours. He made it for me to cut it down and build a nice house with it. And keep the seed and plant the tree. So my son can cut it down and build the house with it too. And my son will do the same thing. And this house life's supposed to go. But nowadays, I'm supposed to go to jail for cutting the tree down. But they're going to rule it on me in the house that is built from a tree. So we don't want to be that unfortunate as minorities in America. We should be voted red because we came to America for freedom and they represent freedom. And that's what I have to say, Mark. What is your last 30 second, one minute shot before we Ace, close the show? Ace, we covered a lot. I appreciate the opportunity. And you know, um, for me, it's always about um, just sharing our experience. And, and we truly are just there to fight um, and make sure that we have the gress- best state in the world with the best economic opportunities available. And, and that helps every single person in the state. The I'm stuff we talk good. about, it shouldn't even be in our dialogue. It's so crazy. Get back to the foundation, what made, what made this country great. And for every immigrant population, it's who we are. Um, I'm third generation. I grew up in the house. My grandfather, my great-grandfather, when he, he landed in, in the country, my grandfather was born in that house. And it's only about five blocks west of the state capital. So I'm a city boy. And so um, we take oh, that like entire the area? Um, Frogtown. Oh, so, wow, that is Midway area. Next I'm Midway, a, Mid, Midway, yeah. Frogtown, Midway is a little bit further west, and that's Midway yeah. and Snelling and Minnehaha is where I raised my children. And so... Um, Wait, did you just say Snelling and Minnehaha? 
That is correct. Maybe I'm living in your grandpa's house. Yeah, no, that was where I raised my children. But my uh, my 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 parents' house was uh, in Thomas and on Thomas and Virginia, in uh, right just just west of the capital uh, as well. So, uh, but right. right. Right, 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 right. When we get off the live, I'll tell you where my address is. Yeah, but but at Ace, we really are. We want to make sure that we operate and get back to the constitutional um, structure of, of government and make sure it's it serves its role, it serves its role well, and that you have the freedom to achieve greatness. And that's what we're all For about. Sure. So, For sure. Ace, I appreciate it. I appreciate you too, my friend. Good luck to the Red Team in November. Thank you. Let's everybody get out and vote. Everybody knows somebody who hasn't voted. Um, give sure. give uh, give our candidates the opportunity to prove that we'll uh, we'll For we'll sure. make life affordable and great in Minnesota. For sure, like my friend Abu posted down here. Please do follow, share, and subscribe to Oromo Affairs. We will keep talking to make sure the Democrats don't cheat us.